Everybody hear me in the back? Yes, good. Uh, my name is Arthur Melzer, and along with my colleagues uh, Dustin Siebel and Richard Zinman, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you to the first in a series of lectures entitled Three University Presidents on Freedom of Speech. Uh, we just have one of them here tonight. We're taking them one at a time. <laughs> Uh, this program is sponsored by the Political Science Department's Symposium on Science, Reason, and Modern Democracy, also known as the Lofrac Forum, uh, which is now in its 31st year of Thrill Pack program. <laughs> the symposium is partly supported from funds by the Lofrac, Lofrac Foundation of New York, as well as a We the People grant from the National Endowment for Humanities. Now, since this is the first event uh, in this series, uh, let me just take a few minutes uh, to describe what it is that we are trying to accomplish. Our topic is something that people have been hearing all about in the news. We hear all the time about college students shouting down speakers or causing them to be disinvited. We also hear about university administrators eagerly using their power to impose speech codes. And as for the university faculty, we see that they are undergoing a marked decline in intellectual diversity, uh, with non-liberal professors and viewpoints becoming increasingly scarce uh, within uh, the university. So all of these changes are coming within the university, from within the university, and mainly one, one can say from the left. But curiously, what one hears a bit less about in the news is that in reaction to all of this, conservatives, mainly from outside the university and often from positions of power both in state and national government, have sought to punish the universities for their liberal bent and push for the firing of various left-wing professors. So in short, the attack on free speech that is our topic uh, and the attack on diversity of thought is really bipartisan. It is coming from both left and right. And that means that everyone, regardless of political orientation, uh, ought to feel endangered by this attack. Everyone's right to speak and to think freely is in danger. But there is a further, still further layer of uh, complexity to our situation. <clears throat> We live in a time of very great partisanship and polarization. And as a result of this, it has become increasingly difficult to trust what one hears in the news and in various social media on any hot topic, including this topic itself, freedom of speech. One is constantly bombarded with outraged accounts of what is happening in the universities. But how much of this is really true? How bad is it? Exactly where does the truth lie? So what we desperately need at this moment in our history is a careful and balanced examination of this whole issue. An examination carried out by moderates of the left in conversation with moderates of the right. An examination conducted not by outsiders looking in, but rather by people who have first-hand knowledge of what is actually happening in our universities, and people who at the same time possess a refined appreciation of what ought to be happening in our universities. That examination is what we are trying to present uh, in the current lecture series, as well as in our three-day conference uh, beginning on April 2nd. So the other events in our lecture series on February 20, we will host Robert Zimmer, president of the University of Chicago. And then on February 27th, we will hear from MSU's own provost, Teresa Sullivan, who is also the former president of the University of Virginia. Tonight's speaker <clears throat> is Michael Roth, who is president of Wesleyan University, a post he has held since 2007. President Roth received his BA from Wesleyan in 1978 and his PhD in history from Princeton in 1984. Since then, he has followed a rich and extremely successful career in university administration, 
while at the same time following a vigorous and prolific scholarly career. He is the author of seven books, the last two of which are most relevant to our topic tonight. In 2014, he wrote, Beyond the University, an award-winning analysis and defense of liberal education. And now last year, he published Safe Enough Spaces, a pragmatist's approach to inclusion, free speech, and political correctness. In addition to tonight's talk, President Roth will also be participating in our traditional uh, morning after seminar, to which all are invited. That's uh, 10.30 tomorrow morning in Madison College Library. Madison College Library is room 332 in South Case Hall. Please join me in welcoming President Michael Roth to MSU. I'm going to try to keep the light out of my eyes and keep the feedback away from you, which I will not be able to do. So I'm going to take, take that off. It's, it's, if you turn that off. You think that'll do it? I think Let's I'll just use that one. Let's try, try now. Okay, I'll just use this uh, yeah, microphone. The other one. Okay. And um, technology and freedom of speech is a great topic. <laughs> Great topic. It's not our topic today, but um, I, I probably have to wear this. <laughs> All right. You don't want to see me undressed in the very beginning of the talk. I usually do that later. Here is the last slide of my presentation. All these people in the back. It's very difficult. I'm going to go back. Uh, this is the last slide of my presentation. Um, and I, well, this is where we'll get uh, in, I don't know, 45 minutes, 40 minutes, okay? So. Uh, we're locking the doors. Uh, as a university president, I'm used to locking the doors when I begin just because I always ask people for money, and I don't want them to run away. Um, in your case, I won't. I promise not to do that. But I will um, uh, ask you to give me questions, because I know there are students here who have ideas about free speech and, and, um, and intellectual diversity, uh, and I, I will, that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but I, I, where I want to end up is here with these three principles of civic engagement. Because what really interests me more than criteria for determining how free your speech is, I don't think those are, that's a useful exercise, what really interests me is getting uh, 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 more stories about the ways in which students and faculty, but especially students uh, in universities all over the country, from community colleges to art schools to big uh, state universities like this one to private liberal arts schools like my own, Students all over the country are out there working in the political system, registering voters, working for candidates, working on issues, uh, 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 and from very different perspectives. Uh, and so I am trying to get lots of schools, and tomorrow I will uh, write to the provost and the president here um, at, at, at MSU, uh, asking them if we can list the programs here in civic engagement as we're listing programs from schools all over the country because we think that civic preparedness is part of the mission of higher education. And that if you engage in political life, it actually increases the depth and breadth of your liberal education. It's good for students. And the last one, I'll come back to at the very end, uh, it's also good for the country. Um, and I think that uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, at this time in American history, I think is absolutely uh, uh, crucial. So, oh, I, we have propaganda from Wesley. They, say, they don't let me leave with uh, out of the PowerPoint of the university. Uh, but this is what you're in for. So, there, uh, Safe Enough Spaces has three parts. Uh, uh, and, and the first one has to do with uh, the, the transition from affirmative action talk to uh, inclusion talk, uh, which happened not that long ago, I think in the last decade. Um, and the, the second part has to do with uh, the use and abuse of political correctness, it's really a, a history of the idea of political correctness. When were you able to actually tell somebody they were politically correct and have that be a meaningful statement? Um, and finally, uh, uh, on uh, free speech and intellectual diversity uh, on American uh, college uh, uh, campuses and, and what presidents and students and uh, faculty can do uh, to foster that. So. There we are. Well, I wrote this book because I was so tired of reading uh, uh, people, sometimes from the academy, 
who are criticizing college students today. Uh, it's, a, it's a long history of this stuff. Uh, but what, right now, there's just so many authors who see that they can uh, find an audience by complaining that students are coddled in the college of American mind, that there's been a defeat at the end of excellence, Anthony Cronin's recent book, that there's that students today are just sheep. You know, that book of DeWissowitz, an excellent sheep. There's just a, there's a whole slew of them. And so I, 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 I don't have a lot of time to write books, and so this one is quite short. Um, uh, uh, but I thought, well, why is it that these uh, people, some of whom are professors or administrators, why are they writing these nasty accounts of students? And my first thought, uh, it's actually the conclusion that I wound up with, which is, they just hate young people. <laughs> <laughs> because when you get to be around my age, I'm, I'm 62, you just hate young people. It's easy to hate young people. We may believe we don't, but it's easy to hate young people. Why? Because they're young. They do stuff we can't do. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so it's just complaining about young people is something old people have done for a long time. And so uh, I went back and found lots of examples, especially from the early 70s, uh, of, of uh, folks who, uh, uh, from, a, uh, from government officials to, to pundits, uh, complaining about students in the 60s, complaining about students in the 70s, complaining about students, you know, you just can chart it out. So I, I'm a historian, so. Uh, I, 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 I decide that's, a, that's worthwhile. Write a book. And my, some of the reviewers complain that I'm too nice about students. They say it must be because he's a college president and he wants the students to like him. I don't think that that's because I'm a teacher. And I think teachers have to actually engage with the students they have. And I complain about the ones they got. Uh, and, and, and I have to say, if, we were, if I was giving this, I'm really glad to be here in, in uh, Michigan State. Because if I was giving this talk in Middletown, half of you would be protesting. <laughs> so even though I'm defending students, this my, the students that I work with, they don't think that I'm you know, doing enough uh, 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 in, in the, uh, on some of the most important issues to them. We'll talk more about that if you want. So first part, from affirmative action to equity and inclusion. You know, I, 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 Wesleyan is a, 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 a school that's difficult to get into. And we take, I don't know, something like 15% of the people who apply. Uh, and, um, and a lot of the discussions around affirmative action and, and who should get in, they, they are targeting schools that are just really hard to get into. Because the question is, does that person who got in deserve to be there more than my daughter who got, I don't, who got rejected? Or my friend who got rejected? But the truth is, and admissions officers hate when I say this, um, it, the, the first few thousand people who got rejected are just as good as the last thousand people who got accepted. There just is no way to differentiate them on some meritocracy scale. There is no good argument. And so, when somebody gets rejected, even though they have a 4.0 or a 3.9, even though they, they you know, fill their resume with credentials of various kinds in high school, and they still get rejected, they look for a reason. And if they uh, happen to be, uh, uh, not be a person of color, and they see people of color getting into the school, they say, well, that's why they got it. And I got rejected. Because they don't say, uh, what's your name? It's Kevin. Kevin. They don't say, well, uh, Kevin got it and I didn't. Because they don't actually know why Kevin got it. Because even Kevin doesn't really know why he got it. <laughs> Even the admissions, right? You don't know. I get calls from alumni. I don't know if this happens here at the uh, provost office or the dean's office. I get call, calls from alumni. I say, I work for Wesleyan. I'm a volunteer for Wesleyan. And so is my wife. She went to Wesleyan, too. I said, oh, that's nice. And I know something bad's going to come. <laughs> I mean, you can hear it, right? And then they say, well, but my, my son, Mark, didn't get it. And I go into my presidential voice, and I say, well, you know, it's a very competitive application, come on, blah, blah. And then, and, but then they say, but he got into Williams. Now I think, why would anyone want to go to a but That's my Williams joke. I have to make one every day. Uh, uh, but but the, the problem is, Williams was harder to get into that year than Weston. 
there is just no good reason I can give these people as to why someone deserves to get in. When so many people apply to schools because those schools reject so many people, you run out of good reasons. I want to make sure I, that last part was clear. I mean, most people, let's say, I'm going to just put it this way, most people apply to Yale because it's hard to get in. Not because they know much about what happens at Yale. They just know that most people will be excluded. And if they get in, they must be better than the people who got excluded. That's how it feels if you get in. <laughs> but there really isn't, I think, a good argument, especially for, let's say, 40% of the class. You know, for some people, they're, they're perhaps shoe-ins almost everywhere. Um, so uh, affirmative action becomes this lightning rod for resentment, dissatisfaction. You point, especially white people will point to uh, people of color and say that they somehow had an advantage that I didn't have. Uh, uh, but the students from underrepresented groups um, also find affirmative action to be troubling because they either are being stigmatized as a potential beneficiary of affirmative action just because of the color of the skin, uh, or, uh, or uh, because they, they feel that the school is not serious about having them there. They're not, the school isn't serious about making it a home uh, uh, for underrepresented groups. Um, and so uh, instead of just counting the numbers of students you have from underrepresented groups, the diversity argument, Instead of just focusing on affirmative action and what we needed either as a form of reparations or as a way of cultivating diversity, which leads to better educational outcomes, both of which things we have talked about and I write about in Safe Enough Spaces, instead, we have, in many colleges and universities, begun to talk about how we can create more inclusion rather than more diversity. And, uh, and you, you've just hired, I think, a new um, high-ranking uh, uh, official, uh, I don't know what is it is, is it a vice, I don't know what you call it, vice provost perhaps, who is in charge, it, it, you, you, you got all of them, in that personal style, just reading in the student newspaper or the school newspaper, this person is a VP for equity and inclusion and diversity and for everything, he put everything in there. Um, and that there's, a, I guess a search has started, at least I've read in the hotel lobbies, uh, uh, MSU news. Um, at Wesleyan, and maybe it happens here at Michigan State too, uh, students from underrepresented groups complain that the university isn't really serious about having them there. That at a place like Wesleyan, I hear students say, you just want us here so that you feel better about the institution. So on the website, you can say, we are an inclusive place. On the website, you can show people of color. That the university hasn't really changed, and that the people from underrepresented groups still feel marginalized by the institution that has accepted them. And so there's a strong pushback at many schools from faculty and students and staff from underrepresented groups uh, against the notion that we just need a higher percentage of this underrepresented group on campus. I've seen this very recently uh, with low-income students. Wesleyan is very expensive. About 45% of our students are on very significant financial aid. Uh, and and uh, I would like to see us raise money so that there are even more low-income students on campus. So let's say 17% of our students are Pell eligible. I'd like to see us have 22, 25% of our students Pell eligible. Uh, which means they're low-income students. And uh, the students at Wesleyan uh, from low-income families have said to me and to the trustees, whoa, Roth just wants to count the number of low-income people on campus so he can feel better about his hypocrisy, his, his, his uh, liberal values. We, the low-income students at Wesleyan right now, we want more services. And we've learned from the things they've demanded 
usually his demands, uh, 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 having to do with food insecurity, having to do with access to health care. And I think they were absolutely right. Instead of just trying to get count more low-income students, we needed to make sure they were fully included in the university's life. And by that, I mean that the students had the ability to take full advantage of the resources of the university. Rich people are very good at taking advantage of resources. They're used to it. They know how to grab them. But low-income students often don't. And so these students, and they convinced the trustees, said instead of having um, more high financial aid packages, take those high financial aid packages and make them even more generous. And uh, th that's a debate we've been having because they said, we don't feel included. We need more inclusion. So in 2010, I hired a chief diversity officer uh, as the vice president for diversity. Uh, when she uh, left to go to another school, uh, uh, I hired a, ch a, a vice president for equity and inclusion. And, and, and I think that the, the task in that position is to uh, find a way to change the culture of the campus so that almost everyone, perhaps everyone, can feel they have the ability to take full advantage of the resources uh, of the institution. But there is a tension, and in my three parts of this, I'll always end with a tension. There's a tension between the desire for inclusion and the educational mission of the universe. And I, I, I know it's, we like to, I think people like to cover that over, but I do think there really is a tension. Because sometimes, in a university, students should be made to feel stupid. And when you feel stupid, you don't feel included. Now, you may say that's old, that's terrible, that's old school, you shouldn't make anybody feel stupid, but I, I, what I mean is, like when I was a, a student at Wesleyan, I handed in a paper to this professor I like, really respected, and he was, he was, he was tough, and, and, and uh, I got it back, and it was a fine grade or something, but on the back page, and I, I, I have it, <laughs> it said, Mr. Roth, you have an awkward, comma, wooden style. Get help! Exclamation <laughs> Now uh, today you'd probably sue the professor, uh, uh, but 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 it was a great gift actually. He was right, um, uh, and uh, I needed to, but I didn't feel included at that moment. <laughs> I felt like a schmo. In a biology class, if you're doing the theory of evolution, you raise your hand and you say, "Excuse me, professor." Excuse me, professor. I actually think evolution is a hoax perpetrated by the secular establishment on religious people who know through their faith that the world is created through design. The biology professor's job is not to make you feel included. And in many biology classes, you might be told you should probably move to another major. There will be a tension there, even if your professor is nicer than Michael Roth and set, tries to be gentle about telling you that your theory that cancer isn't caused by smoking, but that smoking actually, you know, whatever. Or that you read an article by the Williamsburg Society for the Prevention of Vaccinations, and you bring it to your, your, uh, uh, your science class, and you talk about it, and the scientist said, sorry, that's bogus stuff. <laughs> You're not going to, I think you're not going to feel included. So how do faculty make students feel included? The average grade at Yale is an A. <laughs> it's easier to feel included when you get an A. You don't want to tell everybody that because the parents think, oh, look, my little Mikey Roth got an A. They don't realize everybody. And, and I, I say that because I, I want, I'm not supposed to say, it wasn't, it's an A minus, not so much better. It's easier to be included when you're not being told how far you are from being good at something. And for me, it's very interesting because in sports, you don't see this so much, where people actually are pushed to go beyond what they thought they could possibly do. But we can, we can talk about that in a question and answer period. So there's this tension between inclusion and critical thinking, which will be relevant to how we talk about political correctness and how we talk about free speech. So the second part of the book, 
It's really a history of the use of the phrase politically correct. I found it interesting, because I'm a historian, I found it interesting that in the, uh, between the First and Second World War, people would use the, way, the phrase politically correct without it being a negative thing. It's like you wanted to be politically correct, which meant that actually your political activity was in line with your theory. Your, your ideas were in line with your activities, or as we used to say in, the, in, the, in Marxist circles, theory and praxis were aligned. That's what political correctness meant, and then it became an ironic use by the 1960s, and with the rise of the new left in the 1960s, there became a strong wave of, uh, of anti-conformism. Many radicals no longer wanted to have their activity conform to anything, let alone a set of ideas and a theory. So people would say that you're merely politically correct as a way of criticizing your failure to be truly radical, because a true radical would be unpredictable. When I was a student at Wesley, the 70s, I invited, I invited uh, Herbert Marcuse, who came and spoke to us, uh, a great Marxist philosopher. He, I remember he told us, we're walking to the give, I was, he was going to give a lecture like this. We're walking across the street, just like, what's the name of that big road in front of this building? You know? Harrison. Harrison. Harrison, right? So you, you, you were walking across the equivalent of Harrison Street. He looks at me and he says, Rod, we should shut this down. I said, what shut down what? He said, the street. Bring this food, sit down, shut it down. I said, why? He said, because their cars are bad. And he was serious. He wanted us to just like, impulsively grab 100 students, have them sit in the street, no, I'm sorry, and, and, and shut it down. Because the theory that Mark Russo had called for that kind of political action. I brought Murray Bookchin, a great anarchist, a, a, a theorist at the time in the 70s, and I asked him, what are we doing? He was an anarchist. He said, I don't know. What do you want to do? <laughs> he, he, for him, that, that, that I would ask for instructions was already a sign of my political my decadence, that I was so weak already. I needed instruction. He, 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 he wanted to get out from conformity, too. Um, Politically correct, and then I trace in the book the way feminists use the words politically correct, which is, I think, really fascinating, and I, uh, I think it's fascinating because I'm trying to sell you the darn book, right? And that's true. Uh, all proceeds go to financial aid, wasn't it? But, but I, I think it's interesting it, until the 90s, and then it becomes the use of the words politically correct that you all know. Uh, but in the 87, I think it is, Alan Bloom writes The Closing of the American Mind, which was a surprise bestseller. I mean, it was rejected by presses and then it was published by a commercial press and really took off. It's surprising because it's not, uh, it's got some real philosophy in it. Um, and it is a critique of higher education culture that I think becomes the template for much of the complaints about students and faculty today. Bloom did not use the words politically correct. Uh, but he described what he said was a intolerant tolerance. And what he meant was that students and faculty today have as their highest virtue that you shouldn't think you know more than someone else or that everybody should tolerate everyone else. And if somebody came in and said, I'm actually a Platonist, and I know there's a hierarchy of goods, or I'm a religious person, and I know that the most important thing is love or salvation, uh, that person will be violating the implicit credo of colleges and universities, which is that everybody's equal, and everybody should be included, even if your idea is stupid. And Bloom, who really didn't like college students, like he, he had another problem, but, but, but he really liked college students, because he didn't like the music, he didn't like the way you dressed, he didn't like, he didn't like the culture, but he wed that antipathy to university students to a critique of liberal culture. A culture, he said, that cultivated an anything-goes attitude so that you can't actually stand up for what's right. Because you might say, well, that's your view. I have to respect you because I have to respect everyone. And Bloom thought this was a sign of the, the end of Western civilization, really. Uh, he was pretty dramatic. Um, and and uh, so that book catches fire. A lot of people uh, accept that kind of argument. And in the 1990s, the use of the words politically correct as a way of describing people who inhibit free speech 
because of their concern that people should, no one should feel bad or no one should be insulted. That takes off in the 1990s, and not immediately. Roger Kimball writes a book called Tenured Radicals in the 90s. So he, um, he doesn't, the first edition does not use the word words politically correct. The second edition is like 16 times. Uh, there are some students from Westing who wrote a movie called PCU, Politically Correct University. And they made fun of people who, like, who go to Westing, who were social justice warriors before we had that phrase, and who were basically puritanical political people, by which they, they, they were so sure of their virtuous uh, progressivism that they looked down on people who drink beer and hang out, or in that movie smoke pot, I think it was. Um, and, and, um, and of course, it's like a, almost a proto-animal house kind of, and so it's that the deans and the president all get um, destroyed uh, by their attempt to be progressive instead of letting anarchy reign. The moral of the story in the 90s was that there's a new puritanism afoot. It inhibits speech and it inhibits thought, and let's call that new puritanism political correctness. First President Bush gives a speech attacking political correctness. Bill Clinton gives a speech attacking political correctness when he's president. The second President Bush gives speeches <laughs> attacking political correctness. And even President Obama has done it. And of course, President Trump, as in so many other areas, has exceeded expectations. In this regard, he has used uh, the, 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 the label politically correct as a way of deflecting all kinds of, of uh, questions or concerns. Uh, in the book, I just mentioned the one in the primaries when Megyn Kelly, you may remember her, she was a TV star once. Um, uh, <laughs> it's a laugh in LA, but you know, you know, you know, Megyn, you know what I mean, Megyn Kelly? It's not funny. All right. All right. Fair enough. So anyway, she asked a question about she citing lots of things that uh, 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 candidate Trump and then had said about women. They were just god awful. And and he said his answer was political correctness is killing our country. And that move, whenever you feel like you have been found out, you, the move. Oh, you're just being politically correct. You know, I, I, when I, my students now, I say, you know, your paper's four days late. And they say, oh, you're so politically correct. <laughs> you know, it works. It doesn't work, actually. But, but it's just a way of deflecting attention. Um, and it, but it has led to a belief that I think is quite strong that on many colleges and university campuses, people who don't believe in the liberal consensus, if I can use that phrase, uh, will not speak up. I can't tell you how many times I have read it, from major publishers and major newspapers, people complaining that they are silent. Now that's funny, actually. You should have left. Uh, it's funny because these are people who say they're silenced and they keep saying it out loud again and again and again. They say it in the Washington Post, they say it in the New York Times, they say it God knows, in the National Review, in the American Standard. They keep telling us how silenced they are, but they're talking all the time about being silent, being afraid to speak. They don't seem to be afraid to speak, but if you are afraid to speak, the problem isn't that there are inhibitions on speech. The problem is that you are afraid. You're, you have no courage. You have to step up. You have to get some courage to speak up. And there is a tension between um, wanting more freedom of speech and intellectual diversity and having the faculty, especially, have academic freedom to teach the classes the way they want to teach them. Um, and and um, if I tell my friend in the American Studies program at Wesley, which is a pretty lefty program at a pretty lefty school, if I tell the American Studies uh, uh, professor that her class is just only using one political point of view, she would rightly say to me, that's none of your business. My it's my class. If the students come to me and say, every time I say something that's not progressive, I am told that I'm an idiot. And I don't think that's like saying cigarettes don't cause cancer. I think that's I'm just not agreeing with the value system of the professor. That's, I think that's an obvious problem. A problem of faculty or students not willing to entertain ideas that are quite different from their own and have a claim 
at legitimacy and have a claim at legitimacy. Uh, so that, that takes us through uh, 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 the first two parts, the first two parts of the book. Uh, and then the third part. See how I'm doing on time? Okay, we're going uh, Free speech and intellectual diversity. So um, I take the argument in the book that the you'll hear from the president of the University of Chicago, which has made free speech a kind of branding uh, platform for the university. Uh, they have the Chicago principles, and, which are perfectly reasonable, I think. But they have uh, articulated uh, uh, what I think of as a free market approach to free speech, or the libertarian approach to free speech. Uh, and in Safe Enough Spaces, I argue that that's inadequate, just like it's inadequate uh, economic policy to have a totally unregulated economy, it's inadequate uh, uh, cultural policy to think you can have totally unregulated speech, and, and almost no one really argues for that. I was at a meeting uh, yesterday at, in, at Yale with a bunch of college university presidents, and a university president stood up and said, you know, students today don't actually have the same affection for the First Amendment that we do. And I thought, well, that's because students today grew up with Citizens United. Students today know that speech is framed, amplified, corrupted by power and money. And that people who defend free speech are also people who defend the lack of regulation on activities that can actually turn out to be extremely harmful to the most vulnerable populations. And I'm well aware that, there are, that free speech has also been used to protect vulnerable po populations, of course, in, in, the, in American history, very dramatically so um, in, in, the, in the 20th century. But in our time, we have, I think, to pay attention to the ways in which the libertarian approach to speech, which is to code many actions and policies that we might object to as speech that could be protected, I think we have to be aware of that. And as college university presidents or provosts or deans or professors, I think it's our business to cultivate educative speech and not embrace a purely procedural approach to speech, which would say that anything goes and the only cure for bad speech is more speech, which is a famous uh, phrase from a Supreme Court decision. All we need is more speech. Now, uh, most of the time, most of the time, I'm going to err on, yes, more speech is good, but sometimes, under the rubric of speech, you get intimidation and harassment. In Connecticut right now, there is a lawsuit by a man who is printing up guns on a laser uh, printer without serial numbers so that they could be used without being traced. He's not using the Second Amendment. He's using the First Amendment. Making a gun is a creative activity. It's a kind of expression. You make speeches, I make guns. There are countless examples in the courts of policy areas that would never have been thought of as speech before uh, are now coded as speech and can be protected. If I don't want to sell you uh, a, a cake because you're uh, getting married to someone of the same gender, I, um, I can appeal not just to freedom of religion, but I can appeal to freedom of speech. My speech is my cake. Sailor right. my Pastries are my expression. You shouldn't force me to address them to people who I find um, doing immoral things. The, the category of speech has expanded dramatically in, by the courts and by libertarians who used to really have a narrow definition of speech that was protected as because it was just political speech. It's been expanded so that unregulated activities will, will that realm will be expanded. It's the realm of unregulated activities to be expanded, and that means that people with the ability to create more stuff, to, to amplify speech, to, to change policies, people with power, money, and privilege, they will have more advantages. And I argue in the book, just like we recognize, that I think most people, that, most people not everyone of course, but most people that don't think that the goal, our goal should be to have a totally state-regulated economy. Um, most people also recognize that a totally unregulated economy uh, results in pollution 
of the kind that is not reversible in any obvious way. You can't just have more water in Flint, to take a local example. And there are forms of speech that are polluting. They are harassing and they're intimidating and they have extraordinarily powerful negative effects. And I think our job has to be um, to watch out for those things. At the same time, I don't think you can just take a free market approach to speech and hope that the academy becomes more intellectually diverse. We all know, and it was referenced in the introduction this, this afternoon, that there is a very strong leftward tilt on the faculties of many colleges and universities, especially in the Northeast, but across the country. Um, and, and, um, and I do think that's a problem. I have to say that it, it doesn't mean that if, if you have a leftist point of view, it doesn't mean you can't teach uh, a conservative thinker, of course you can. And many people do all the time. Uh, I teach a course on virtue and vice, from Confucius to Spike Lee. And, and you know, so he's Confucius, and then Aristotle, and then Aquinas. So I'm teaching Aquinas. I'm a Jewish kid from Long Island. And I'm teaching the greatest Catholic philosopher of the Middle Ages, maybe, and well be. And I want to sell Aquinas. I want everyone in that class feel like Aquinas is changing my life right now. <laughs> I'm not, well, that's not because I've become a Catholic. It's because I think teaching this text so that people take the question seriously is my job as a teacher. Nonetheless, I think you will see, especially in some fields, an extraordinary filtering of opinions and subjects discussed on ideological grounds. And so I started at Wesley what I called an affirmative action program for conservatives. Guaranteed to annoy almost everybody. Uh, friends of mine on the left said, you've sullied the words affirmative action by getting them close to the word conservative. Um, and I was, I was really, somewhat surprised by that because they didn't seem to like the words affirmative action. Um, and then conservatives said, hey, we don't need affirmative action. We just need a fair playing field. And I, that was not true either. Um, and just like it was the case that we had to be proactive in cultivating diversity in admissions um, and in hiring, we need to be proactive in cultivating, curating, if you will, intellectual diversity on college campuses. And at Wesleyan, that's meant uh, uh, creating a fund to bring serious scholars of religion, of libertarian thought, of conservative traditions, uh, so that students are not going to be pestered by these bozos who come to campus just to provoke you, just to uh, make a, a scene, um, uh, uh, who are not actually edu educative. They have no intention of being educative. They're just there to test your free speech credentials. I want actually serious scholars to come and talk about serious issues. I, I made the mistake of, of recommending one such scholar to the, for the series. Uh, uh, that was run by the social science department. My job was to have to the president. I had to get to come find the money, which I did and then give it to a faculty member to invite the speakers. Now we have military uh, veterans who are professors uh, who taught at West Point or Annapolis. Uh, we have the speaker series. We have a, you know, a much more going on. But in the first year, I went to one of the lectures. And as I'm walking there, I thought, I hope no one's there. Because you know, it, was, you know, it was after all these incidents at Middlebury and elsewhere where speakers were shouted down. I thought something could happen like that. I get to the room. It's packed. Smallish room, it was, but it was packed. And um, my wife and I were there, she's a teacher at Wesleyan too, and we were supposed to have dinner with the guy afterwards. He gives his talk. It was very lazy, <laughs> it was intellectually weak. First question comes from a student, just right to the heart of things, exposes a flaw in the argument, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. My wife leans over me and says, I'm not going to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and then a student right behind me raises his hand. He says, well, if this is what Roth means by intellectual diversity, I have to say, I hope we can do a lot better. <laughs> and I, you know, although I had this arrow in my back that I had to take out, I actually thought he, that was great. He wanted a more serious conservative speaker. He wanted a more serious scholar than the person who was there that day, or at least than that talk that he heard. Um, so affirmative action program to create more spaces, rather than relying on the faculty to do it themselves or things just to work out that way, I think is an important uh, feature of what we have to do as, as college and university presidents, because we can't just rely on pure procedure. 
nobody really thinks that all speech is permissible. When I have to have debates about this, the, the other side always just me. He always recites some verses from John Milton, because Milton wrote, of course, very powerfully, beautifully, about free speech. But he said, free speech for Protestants. <laughs> Catholics, then we extirpate. We kill them. Everyone has a lot. You can ask uh, the President of the University of Chicago if he has a, a line. Maybe he'll say no, but I think everyone has a line uh, where they say no more of that. And I say, I use the phrase harassment or intimidation. Okay, so um, I want there to be places on campus that are safe enough so that students can encounter very disturbing material, offensive or just wildly different kinds of ideas, so they can actually learn in a transformative way. If they're too safe, if they're too safe, they learn nothing. They just have the echo chamber. And you've probably been in classes like that, where you may get some more, you get, you get piled on things, but you may not get enough um, uh, diversity in thinking um, that allows you to expand your own way of approaching the world and your place in it. I use this title, Safe Enough Spaces, because uh, it's just a joke, actually. Uh, I'm not very good at uh, title jokes, I guess, but uh, because that psychoanalyst in the 50s and 60s talked about a good enough parent. In the 50s, it was just a good enough mother, because fathers were ex exempt, I guess, but, and, and that just meant a, a parent that wouldn't drive you crazy, <laughs> wouldn't make you psychotic. If you had a parent, if you were a parent, you tried too hard to make your child perfect, you'll make them crazy. If you are a parent says you want to learn about the laws of physics, Put on a blindfold, go play in traffic. That's also not such a great idea. What you want is a parenting that's good enough to keep you from going crazy, but it doesn't aim at perfection. We need spaces on college campuses that are safe enough to allow for transformative learning, but not so safe, not so safe um, that they um, just give you an echo chamber of your own uh, thinking. Finally, the slide you saw when you came in. Um, I think that the proof of this kind of uh, speech, this kind of intellectual diversity, this kind of work, the proof of its efficacy uh, would come not by how things are going on campus, but what students do with what they've learned when they leave campus. I wrote a book a few years ago called Beyond the University, um, and so I, in which I argued that the, the, the the proof of the value of liberal education is not how happy students are while they're in college, but what they do with it years and years uh, after leaving college. And the proof of the value of intellectual diversity, I think, will be if you can take your skills as students and staff members as faculty and, and through civic participation, uh, learn about your fellow citizens and your neighbors and your and the people uh, uh, around this country um, and, and learn about yourself in the process of discovering you might be wrong about some key things. Other people may have things to teach you. The proof will be not how well you do in political science classes, but how equipped you are to act politically. So civic preparedness is a phrase I take from Daniel Allen, uh, who, uh, a political theorist uh, uh, at Harvard now, uh, that political civic preparedness is something as higher education institutions we are supposed to uh, cultivate. Uh, and that if we do that, and we get students to participate in American political life, they learn about the diversity of ideas, um, and they acquire the habits of citizenship, which should not be a, a, a confused just with voting. Voting is one dimension of it, but that it's a small one. It should be a small dimension of it. It should be part of the fabric of being a participant in active active citizenship. We did microgrants in 2018 to students who want to go off and knock on doors uh, during our fall break right before the 2018 elections. You know, at Westing they would knock on somebody's door down the hall and it would be a Leninist. And then they'd go down the hall and they'd knock on it and it'd be a, a liberal. And then the next door would be a Green Party guy. You know, that, well, they went to Ohio or they went to Michigan and they went to Wisconsin. And they, they could just go up the road in Connecticut, actually. And when they knock on doors, they find people with different views, but people who will want to talk to them. 
I mean, not everybody can have a conversation, but many people can, even though they differ fundamentally about what's good for the country or what's good for their neighborhood. They find common points, and they find that they can agree to disagree. Active citizenship is a practice. It's not really a theory. The, the last part is that um, if we do that, if higher education does that, I think we actually can make a contribution to the country. So I'm putting these principles up. I wrote to, I don't know, 100 presidents today asking them if we can list their institutions and the work they're doing because these are basic principles that guide some of the work they're doing in this sphere. Because I want us to not talk about coddled students or snowflakes or intolerant social justice words. I want to talk about students who are making democracy work because they're out there as active citizens. Lord knows we need it. Because this year, uh, we need to make the democracy work. We need to see who we are and what we want as a country. And not just roll our eyes at our differences. Or throw worse, <laughs> throw rocks at each other. By cultivating intellectual diversity in the classroom and on the campus, I hope we cultivate a spirit of inquiry and a capacity to listen that will serve all of us in this country um, at a time we really need. Thank you. So the uh, floor is open to questions. Take a sip of water. Uh, Thank you for that. I wonder if you um, make any distinction between civic society and civil society, and if such, do these principles apply to civil society? I think they apply to civil society. I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, in the tradition there. In, in the liberal tradition that civil society is not political. Well. Churches, other organizations. I know. No, I, 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 I use the, 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 in parts of the liberal tradition for sure, uh, uh, but the um, I use the phrase public sphere interchangeably with uh, uh, civil society. So yeah, so I, I don't. Um, um, I, I think that the uh, the public sphere is opposed to the private sphere, but uh, it's, it's really what I'm talking about now. But of course, there are these other dimensions of of corporate life. Uh, whether that, that be uh, in religion or in uh, uh, other organizations that, so to speak, lie between the individual and the government. I, I, I think those are um, certainly worth noticing and making those distinctions, but I, I'm actually, the distinction I'm interested in here is trying to uh, energize uh, people from leaving their private life into public life. Um, and today in the United States, it would be an interesting question to think about, say, religion and to what extent it can be separate from the political life. Yes? Uh, actually, I have a question. What do you think it should be taught? Like, should it be taught in elementary school? Like, you kind of focus on just college kids, but I feel like kids learn a lot of their beliefs in their younger ages. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. I, I, I do think that um, uh, we could do a much better job in this country uh, in elementary school in, in giving uh, students a sense of um, how, how the government works, uh, how their towns work, and how their counties work. I mean, and, uh, and, 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 and because many students who come to college at a place like West End, I don't know how it's true here, they, they, just, don't, they just don't know. Um, uh, or they may have been taught, they've forgotten, and I, I think part of that is, are you using what you the, the, the stuff you've been asked to memorize? I mean, are are you going to go to the to the to the city hall, or are you going to think about the library as a public institution? Are you going to are, are you going to begin to to practice being uh, uh, not just your an individual, not just in your family, but in a community? And I do think that can start uh, quite early. Uh, I, I think what happens when you get to the college university uh, context is uh, students are, in fact, they are going to be extreme, maybe quite critical of the 
context available to us for political action. And so uh, one can, uh, as a, a, a certain kind of uh, uh, intellectual, think that the public sphere is so uh, polluted uh, or so um, uh, corrupt that uh, I, I can describe its bad side. I can I can describe its, its how it's not working. But I'm not going to get in. I'm not going to participate. I mean, there, there is a sense I think, and I see it on my campus, uh, uh, that that people say, "Oh, Rock, you're so naive to think it matters. It's good for the country that people would participate." And they get I get the professorial eye roll sometimes uh, that that I'm naive to think that people can do something. Uh, I, I think that. Uh, a mature political practice actually has to happen when you're the age to think for yourself. So, so not when you can be taken to, let's say, a demonstration by your parents or by the, uh, your congregation or by your uh, school. I was in India a couple of weeks ago, and I saw these demonstrations right out my window from the hotel, and, I, and there, there's been a lot of conflict in India around some uh, anti uh, Muslim laws, as you may have heard, and so I thought it had something to do with this, but then I would see these demonstrators, and they were walking along, and they were all in kind of uniform. Um, they were all dressed the same. And so, and what could this be? So I screwed up my courage as the, the, the dumb American, you know, I don't really know much about the city I'm in there. And so I go out to, and I ask, and I see they're all young people. They're all maybe 15, 16, maybe even a little younger. And so I said, so what are you, I see their signs, it says, Stay in your lane. And like all, and all these kids wearing the same t-shirt, the same shorts, and it says, stay in your lane. So I'm thinking, I guess that's a metaphor for you know, immigration or something. I didn't know what it was. And then you know what it was? They were there protesting bad driving. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are others, and then I went further, and there's a whole group of kids, they're adorable, you know, all dressed the same, and they have all these signs that said, don't honk. It's noisy. What's going on here? What was going on is that these students were being brought to demonstrations so they could buy their kind of private private school so that they could put on their credentials at, at public service. They were engaged in public service. Now I get it, right? You want to create habits of public service, but at the same time, you can imagine that you're also seeding a kind of cynicism that this stuff is rote, that it's not meaningful. That, so I, I think it's um, finding a way to um, promote political practice without ideological filters. Um, uh, uh, sometimes it's incentivizing it, uh, but it's important that it, it come from the student's own interests, desires, and curiosity. Um, that's why our program, we, for this uh, E2020, we're giving students internship money to do this. And it's a little, you know, it's a little uh, odd. We're paying people to participate. In our, you know, well, we're giving them internships so they can come back and work in a class where they learn, they talk about what they've learned from what they've done. But our students, probably like the students here, they don't want to be told what to do. They want to be given the tools to do things that they find meaningful. Um, and so institutions, I think, have to find the right way to let students learn for themselves how they want to participate in the public sphere. Other question? Yes? Um, very provocative uh, talk. No, this, I don't think I need one. Okay. Uh, very provocative talk filled with uh, uh, many thoughts that uh, I would like to respond to, but I'll limit myself to the following. Uh -oh. uh, <laughs> no, no. I, I'm not quite sure about the argument as a whole, because it seems like almost as if there's a part missing. So let me put it this way. Is there a particular kind of education that needs to take place in the classroom in order to prepare students to engage in the kind of participatory civic education that you're uh, um, promoting? Uh, or does it not matter? And what really, what and the real learning takes place, especially the learning concerning, say, difference, mm -hmm. really takes place not in the class. It doesn't matter if you teach in the classroom. 
just put students in the situation of knocking on doors, and that's where the learning takes place. So it's not clear to me whether it matters what goes on in Wesleyan's classrooms. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it, uh, it's sometimes not clear to me uh, what goes on, whether it matters what goes on in the classroom. Uh, I, I think that, um, uh, that students should learn in the classroom not what they can forget after the papers are in and the exams are done, but they should learn in the classroom our habits of mind and, and, and ways uh, of thinking that they will continue to employ when they're not in the classroom. So if what happens in the classroom stays in the classroom, then it doesn't matter. Um, uh, except that you get a stamp that you've taken that class, it's on your transcript, and as someone was telling me as well, that you know, your transcripts, which are the same kind of documents that um, your grandparents or maybe great parents, great grandparents had. So make nothing as if as if the world hasn't changed. What ha what happens in the classroom matters if you can take what happens in the classroom and translate it to what you want to do in other areas. Sometimes that's in another classroom. I mean, sometimes it takes a long time. You learn some techniques in a lab, and then you have to learn to build techniques on top of them in the next lab. And but ultimately, what what if, if what we do is meaningful? I think it has to be meaningful beyond the classroom beyond the university. And so I think that uh, at a college and university where there is intellectual diversity, where there is a, a, a struggle for inclusion and equity, that these practices should equip our students to more successfully navigate the public sphere. Um, if, it, if they don't, I guess I think they don't matter as much as, I would, I would have to conclude they don't matter as much as I thought they did. I mean, I'm very proud of the fact that at, at a place like, maybe this is true here too, but a place like Wesleyan, we, we make our students, or we give our students the opportunity, I'm supposed to say, to live on campus all four years. They have to, actually, though. <laughs> we give them the opportunity to, to obey. Right? They have to live on campus all four years. We have nice houses, blah, blah, blah. So what happens? Somebody who's uh, uh, from, uh, from Flint is living in the same residence hall as a guy whose father's name is on the top of the building. And somebody uh, 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 from uh, uh, the South Bronx uh, is in sharing a suite with someone who is from Greenwich, Connecticut, which is one of the most affluent communities in the country. That's not going to happen when they leave. I mean, America is so segregated, as you know, by class and, uh, and by race, that it's very unlikely they'll have this experience again. So what can happen in a campus is they can create uh, possibilities of learning from people who they would otherwise not have contact with. And I hope that gives them the appetite and the talent to continue to learn from people that they now want to have contact with when they leave the university. So I think it's important what happens in the classroom. But what's less important are the facts uh, that you memorize, and you know this, uh, than the, the habits of mind that you build up, the muscle you build up, the intellectual muscle you build up. But, but again, uh, I'm not sure whether you're, you're what you're arguing is that that intellectual muscle can be built up in any way, or whether there are better and worse ways of building it. There are better and worse. Whether there are ways of, uh, uh, of, of, of not building it at all. Yeah, there, sure, there are lots of ways of doing it. And, and uh, I think one of the great strengths of the American higher education world, it's not really a system, is that there are so many ways in which we, uh, we make available as people to learn. Um, and and so uh, I don't think uh, there are better and worse ways for different kinds of people. Um, and I, I think part of what happens uh, over the course of, if it takes four years, four years, that uh, students learn what are the ways in which it works for them. I, don't, I think there are better and worse ways, but I don't think there are better and worse ways for everyone. Um, and, and nor do I think that the, the best ways for the people who get the summa cum laude are the, somehow the best ways, the most excellent ways. I don't believe that. I, I, but I do think some, I, I, I see it, I mean, we all see it as teachers. Sometimes the, the stuff we do doesn't work. It, the students don't, not only don't they like it, they don't seem to have it actually exercised. And, 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 you know, some people swim and some people run track. I don't think track is superior because you don't need water. So I think it's just not this, it, you know, there are lots of, but there are really stupid things you can do in track that injure yourself and don't build muscle. Likewise, you, you don't use weights in the pool. Huh. 
thought that was funny. <laughs> your comments and I share your very much share your perspective on uh, the importance of intellectual diversity and the opportunity for all of us students faculty and staff to participate in such an environment I'm uh, with that with that agreement with your um, argument I wonder if you might speak particularly to what I see as a quite challenging situation in our society now and perhaps a challenge that uh, is right at our doorstep in our colleges and universities. And that is the challenge for um, actually being able to discern truthfulness in the news and being mm -hmm. able to uh, bring habits of critical thinking, which of course we do want to cultivate uh, among our students, among yeah. all of us. But I wonder whether, I, I guess my own thinking is we have a particular challenge at this point in our society and how your thinking might relate to how do we deal with that? Is it enough to have intellectual diversity, or might we particularly need to be thinking about explicitly cultivating certain habits of critical thinking and discernment? And I'd be interested in it's this. A great, it's, a, it's a great question, and I, I, I don't know that I have a great, great answer to it, because um, I'm not sure that there are methods of critical thinking that uh, will work for everyone um, that will be um, available for um, everyone to, to discern some of the subtle ways in which uh, lying back by money uh, has corrupted uh, public discourse and, 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 the, and the public sphere. Um, I do think it's important to teach students how to use evidence and to also teach them how to recognize when others are not using evidence. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, so I think there are some basic ways of uh, under, uh, helping students understand how arguments are crafted, how, how to recognize evasions when they happen, uh, to to recognize the rhetorical moves through which people use that people use to uh, uh, stay out of the, 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 the light of truth. Uh, I, I I think it's important for our students to learn. Um, the techniques of what is uh, Steve Bannon called flooding the zone with shit, I think is what he said. That was his phrase. Um, I, and I think, but, it, and being more attuned to how that happens, I think is, is uh, an important thing. I also think, however, that uh, one of the, what, some of what happens these days is the, is a result of a general failure of trust in institutions of knowledge authority. And that's not exactly the same thing as a failure of critical thinking. In other words, when the American Cancer Society says something, I believe them, uncritically. The national, when, the, when the NIH uh, announces certain things, or CDC, I, 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 we had a student uh, who was, we were testing for the coronavirus. He didn't have it, so don't worry, I'm okay. Um, uh, we were testing, so he sent, what did we do? You know where well, you send the test? There's only one place still where you can send the test. To the CDC. So what would happen if I went to one of my uh, people in the science studies program and said, what do you think? The CDC, isn't, that, isn't it wrapped by racism? Uh, isn't it a, a, a product of he hegemonic forces uh, that have used science in the service of industry? Well, those things are, are, are true. But I think he'd say, send the damn thing to the CDC. <laughs> Because we want to know if that, because he still wants it, he, he believes, my friend who uh, does a science studies, he believes that in this case we should trust the CDC. Uh, and I'm here, I'm just really stealing things from Stephen Shapin, a uh, great historian of science, uh, who wrote recently in the Boston Review that the problem is that we don't need more critical theory, we don't thinking, and it's not that we need more science, it's that we need to create more trust in institutions of legitimate scientific expertise. He, Shapin said, who had, he has training as a microbiologist, but he says, I don't really understand the climate science. But I actually trust the authorities. But if you are groomed to distrust authorities of all kinds, you can say, well, I found a, sci a, a climate uh, 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 in, in, the, in the oil fields of, of, of North Dakota. I found a, I found a, a climate institute, and they say, not oil. 
Or I, that, that he gives this example, I find a, 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 an anti-vaccination group in Williamsburg. And they say, vaccinations uh, are killing our children. And you say, no, the NIH says, or the, uh, you know, some other, but, so their problem isn't that, it's not exactly critical thinking, and it's not exactly uh, fact-based reasoning. It, you can get there, but I do think there's a problem of um, the delegitimization of, uh, of, of knowledge authority. Uh, and, um, and that is coupled with the good old American anti-intellectualism, which has been here for a long time, uh, but with a but with uh, a now a willingness uh, to ignore scientific expertise uh, if it gets in the way of political or economic advantage. And I, 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 the only way I know how to is to try to expose that when we think we see it. Um, but how to rebuild trust in scientific authority? That's a tough one. Um, uh, even though, and, and maybe the answer will be in the long run, most people going to college today are, are looking at STEM fields. So they kind of, with their feet, they're showing that kind of trust. But um, in the public sphere, the trust in scientific authority, like the trust in any other elites, so-called elites, has really been diminished. And I do think that's a, that's a horrible a problem to have. And, and, uh, and, and we, may, we are being tested in that regard around climate change. And we may be tested around other things as well. Yes? Um, do you think that a lack of um, uh, intellectual diversity uh, causes uh, an intensification of political polarization on like a, a grander scale? I, I, I think that's probably right. Uh, I, I, the question, is, does a lack of intellectual diversity contribute to polarization? I, I think you mean that by a grand, just not at the university, but you know, more generally. And I, I think what happens is, well, people have written about that tribalism, I guess, uh, as a way of talking about polarization. And I do think there's some truth in that, insofar as we don't have to actually talk, whether on social media or in person or um, in, in, in uh, public settings, we don't have to talk with people who don't agree with us. Uh, we diminish our capacity for empathy, for listening, for understanding someone else's point of view. Now, I've had this conversation with my colleagues at Wesleyan, and I've had people say to me, listen, as someone said, the right wing controls everything off campus, so we're going to control the anthropology part. I, I, and I say, I think, that's, I think that's nuts. I think that's bad for the students, because when they leave, they're not going to stay in the anthropology department forever, like the teachers will. <laughs> um, and, and so, they, but the teachers know that, and they say, we're giving them armor to deal with this oppressive world. And I, I think they're not, actually. I think they're giving them one set of tools that will not actually work on all the problems they have to confront. As a university president, I don't have enough power. Um, and uh, that was also a joke. Boy, it's getting late. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 but uh, I, 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 I've asked them to, to, I mean, just like, listen, uh, when I was a graduate student at Princeton in history, uh, many of the, like, my friends and women graduate students who were feminists, they went to the faculty and said, all women, with one, with one, a couple of exceptions. Natalie Zeman Davis, who's a great, amazing person. They went to the men, real professors, and they said, we want to study women's history. And the men said, oh, we'd love to, but there are no sources. <laughs> right? This was not that long. I'm not that old. This is, uh, I am that old. It's uh, 1980, 1979. There are no sources. So they, they went and found some the sources themselves. And I, you hear it, 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 when I was a student, we'd like to hire women, but there aren't any in the pool. We'd like to hire people from underrepresented groups, but they're not out there. And, and so I hear this now, oh, I'd love to hire a conservative person in uh, English, but there aren't any. And I, I think, and I point out, it sounds a lot like what the admissions office used to say about fill in the blank of an underrepresented group. It's not exactly the same, but the similarity worries me. And I wanted to worry the professors enough so they think about it. So it's not just implicit. They, they, and, and that our students, many of whom, you know, there are more conservative students on our campus than, than the faculty realize, because if the students feel like this is what they need to do to get a grade, they, 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 they know what to do. 
And I think that's horrible. I think if you can't bring your whole self to class, then you're not learning as much as you could. Uh, so uh, we have these conversations now at Wesleyan. We have uh, a new program bringing 10 military veterans every year. By no means are they all conservative. Uh, we have other ways of trying to enhance intellectual diversity. And people debate it. Many students think this is wrong. But the fact that they're talking about debating it seems to be just as good as actually anything else we could do. Because they are confronting the issue in their conversation. Yes? While we're on the subject of political polarization and uh, ideological charging in the classroom, um, it's my experience, and I'll give, I'll give you an example. Um, I won't say what institution, but before I went to MSU, I was at a different university. Uh, not as good. <laughs> It's in my experience, that's probably true. <laughs> okay. uh, and I'm glad I had a, a Soviet elite as a teacher in one of the classes. And let's just say they whitewashed the few things of history and really pushed a certain ideology on Christian against which one. Uh -huh. And only I was like only I was like asking questions or making everyone else was silent, even though when she oh, sorry, I heard I should when they when they uh, open the floor to like questions, no one no one yeah. would raise a hand. How would you because and they told me afterwards, told me after class, like because so because they were too afraid that they'd be shut down the media or they the same treatment I did. How do you think how would you encourage such questioning and critical thinking within the classroom? Yeah, it's a great question. How so? The question is like when the, the example was a, a professor who had a certain point of view on uh, Soviet and Russian history, um, whitewashing uh, some, I suppose, known facts, and and uh, if you if questions arose, uh, over, they, they might be shut. They may be shot down by the professor, or the professor might uh, um, be angry. I guess uh, she, she was. She was angry. Okay. So so. Uh, I, I think it's it's hard for individual students. Uh, I, I think it's a, the, the job of the faculty member not to say that all ideals are, uh, ideas are equal and all visions of history are equal, but to actually um, uh, explain a position in relation to a, a, a contrary uh, a question. And I, I think uh, students uh, should um, continue to ask the kinds of questions that a responsible teacher would feel that it's incumbent upon them to answer. Um, and, um, and, and that doesn't mean that, I mean, I'm not advocating for students to, to, to antagonize the professor, but, but to ask the kind of question that a responsible teacher feels obligated to answer. Uh, and and um, uh, my, I'll give you an example. Uh, I, so I teach these intellectual history courses, and I tell my students, as I told them yes, Wednesday, yeah, well, yesterday, um, uh, we are reading Rousseau and Kant this week. Little essays from uh, each. What is Enlightenment? And Kant and uh, the First Discourse of Rousseau. And so I said they have to write questions about the text uh, on a bullet board. Uh, and so I said, don't tell me what you think of Kant. Like Kant says X, and I don't think it's true. And I tell them I don't care what you think. <laughs> I have no interest in knowing whether you think Rousseau is right. And I say to them though, and you shouldn't care if I think Rousseau. I want you to tell me what, why you think Rousseau said what Rousseau said, or why uh, uh, Karl Marx said what Marx said, or why Virginia Woolf wrote this uh, this way, and, and and to try to get into the text. Um, and some students find that um, uh, that I'm silencing them, and I say, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't care if your your opinion because your opinion about Aquinas doesn't matter. Aquinas matters. And then I stop and I say, listen, make believe this that was true. Do it as a game. If you don't think it's true, that you think your opinion is just as good as Aquinas, just play the game that Aquinas matters so much. And after all this time, we're still reading Aquinas. Play the game to try to think, why does Aquinas say what Aquinas says? Get into that frame of mind. And then most of my students, of course, people who don't like it, they probably drop it. But most of the students actually play the game that way, at the end of the semester, I tell them, you, probably, you should know whether I prefer Rousseau or Marx or Virginia Woolf or Saidiya Hartman. You shouldn't be able to tell. I should actually make a compelling argument uh, for each of them. 
Now, in your case, I think it's hard when someone says they're ignoring historical facts. I think you have to then be strategic in how you navigate the class of learning what you can and recognizing what you're not being allowed to learn. With regards to you wanting to get more conservative professors, is that one of the problems with trying to do that, that certain ideologies lead people into certain fields? Like, you're not going to see an environmentalist being an oil CEO. Yeah, it, it's, there's, there's some truth to that. The question was, don't you see some ideologies having, you know, more affinities in certain fields? And so, um, there, that, there's certainly some truth, there's certain truth to that. Um, but it's, it's, but it, it, it's not universally the case. It's statistically the case. You have to work harder at it. Um, um, uh, but I, 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 I do think that, and I'm not looking for you know, uh, one modern Republican, one right wing Republican, two Democrats. I, I'm actually asking the, 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 the um, faculty and the admissions office to reflect on whether they have ideological filters that prevent them from seeing the quality of work that someone's doing because that work doesn't. Uh, flatter their own ideological preferences. I'll give you an example. Right? So some people say that liberal arts, people who apply to West Ham's liberal arts school, a liberal arts school, they tend to be a little bit more lefty, let's say, a little bit more on the left. Uh, but I was talking to, I did a talk like this in, in Connecticut, and a guy who was a guidance counselor in high school said, I can tell you it was viewed as guidance counselor malpractice. That's the phrase you used to allow a high school student when applying to a college, a fancy college, a selective college, to list as an extracurricular or public service activity anything that would be religious or conservative. He said, we just knew that. So yeah, he, wasn't, like, he wasn't saying this was a good practice. He was just saying it was, mal it was just malpractice because the chances that you would, that you know, if you, if you were protesting to stop pollution, that would be seen as a good thing. If you were protesting uh, to stop abortions, it would not be, and you would not be there. I think that's wrong. I think that's a problem. It doesn't mean, I'm surprised no one's asked me this yet, uh, that doesn't mean I say, well, let's get a couple of Nazis and really have intellectual diversity. No, it doesn't mean that. I don't think you have to be uh, open to all points of view, um, uh, especially those points of view uh, that uh, uh, intimidate and harass members of your uh, the student population, but I, I do think we should try to be aware of how our judgment of quality of scholarship is inflected by our political filters, just as it is off campus. And as in, as uh, as professors and administrators, we should we should fight against that form of bias. Yes, I want to go back to uh, an example you used earlier in your talk. Uh, and to try to get you to talk a little bit more about uh, not only what you mean by inclusion, but uh, what the limits of a concern for inclusion would be. So I was struck by the example you gave. Uh, you had your paper, the professor says your style is wooden, you feel excluded. Yeah. That seems to me not right. <laughs> I mean, uh, I could see why you would be, you might be upset, you might be angry, but why would you feel excluded from a community that is supposed to be dedicated to teaching you how to write, among other things, yeah. to teaching you how to write in, in a non-wooden way? Uh, so it, it seems to me that it, it would be much better, and I think it was truer at one point in um, our history, uh, at least in my youth than it is now, that when you went certainly to an elite institution, uh, your expectation was you would be transformed by that experience. Yeah. That basically you were going into that experience incomplete, let's say defective, in all sorts of ways. And that um, while you might not expect to be completed, while you might not expect to be perfected, you would expect to be in some fundamental ways, maybe in the most important ways, a different person as the result of attending that institution and receiving what used to be called the liberal education. Now, that would preclude your reaction. I write woodenly, I'm excluded. 
Yeah. So what I want to know is, what I, I guess I want to talk about is, are there limits to the concern with inclusion? Yeah. So, so for example, if if I'm right and you're wrong, you shouldn't have felt yeah. uh, uh, excluded. Are there? So, so for example, suppose I am teaching a class and I am either making the argument myself as a philosopher or I'm reading books which say it is fundamentally a mistake for human beings to think of themselves as uh, essentially uh, determined by their gender, their race, their ethnicity. Their... Now, is that, am I in danger of not including people in my making such an argument? Oh, yeah, I think. Or does it depend how I make the argument? Uh, I, I, I think it, it depends. So the question is, are there limits? Uh, so I'm not sure if everybody in the back can hear uh, that. Are there limits to inclusion? And that the mission of the, edu of the educational institution is to transform the students so they're not the same people they were when they leave as they were when they got there. Um, and to, so that my example, I, that I was sharp criticism on a paper, shouldn't make me, make me feel excluded um, uh, because I was actually included in the enterprise of liberal education, which was to become, in this case, a less wooden writer. <laughs> um, um, and, uh, and, and I think that's the way it's, it's supposed to, it, it is supposed to happen. And, 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 but I don't think when I was a freshman in college that I had this expectation of being transformed. I think that's a post hoc uh, description. Um, I, I don't, I, I, my ex expectations, like the students I think today, are ex in co They're very, you know, they, 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 they know they're there, they hope it doesn't, they don't screw up. They, they, um, they certainly there's a, there's a social dimension to this that's very powerful now, maybe it was powerful. And when I was a student, I was just a very nerdy student, so maybe it was less powerful to me. Um, so, uh, so I, but I, I, so I, do, I agree with you, you shouldn't feel excluded. Like when I had a student a few years ago, um, I gave him a C minus on his paper in the philosophy of the film class, and um, he came to see me and he said, I don't understand this. I said, obviously. <laughs> and, and, and uh, he, he's, uh, he was a football uh, 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 captain, he was a quarterback, and he said, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't get C minuses. I don't get C minuses. And I said, well, congratulations. <laughs> now, he could have felt like, Roth, you're a son of a gun, you know, you're, you don't like athletes, like, which I hear from athletes who some, they say some professors really uh, prejudice against them, or some of them, you're, you're an idiot, Roth. Uh, uh, and, and I'm going to drop a course, or I'm just going to make do. I'm not going to learn anything. Instead, this guy said, what do I have to do? And uh, I did not say make a donation to Wesley, and that rumor is not true. Um, I, uh, no, so he made a plan. He worked his, his butt off in that class. He did well. I tell the story with his permission, because he was actually, he felt more included. And there it is, right? That's the thing. As a teacher, you want actually... I think, at least I want as a teacher, to push people so they feel like I'm probably not adequate to the task. And then you show them how they can become adequate to the task. If you instead have a class where they just always feel pretty good about it because it's not that hard, they feel included in the, in the least common denominator kind of way. So, um, so I do think there are clear limits. I mean, I had a... Uh, um, I have a class, uh, and, uh, this may just get us to another free speech issue, the trigger warning issue. Uh, uh, I have this philosophy and movies class, my first class, I remember this in the book, uh, it, uh, we watched Night and Fog, a classic film about the Holocaust from 1955. Uh, it's extraordinarily disturbing, even having seen all the things you've already seen about this period, the images and the cinema, it's just very, very disturbing. Um, and so I say to the class, we meet for 40 minutes, I take a break, and say, you can leave before I show this film. I say, because tonight, first night, first Monday night, we're doing uh, genocide. Next week, we have a, a documentary about child abuse. The following week, we have a, 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 a documentary about a person who was uh, uh, incorrectly convicted of murder, followed by a film the following Monday on mass killings in Indonesia. All these films are extremely upset. If I'm right, that I think they're great powerful films, we read philosophy with them. And you will be very upset. And you know, this class isn't for everybody. If you don't want it, 
deal with that kind of material, leave it to break and all our feelings. And then I say, and if you really like this kind of stuff, get some help. <laughs> and, and they laugh, and maybe a few people leave. I don't think very many people leave. Um, I, had a I, had, I had a student in, uh, after showing Distant Voices Still Lives, a very beautiful film by Terence Davies about growing up in uh, post-war England. Uh, a student came up to me at CCA where I was the president, and I taught this course. He came up to me in the hallway and he said, Roth, you're such a jerk. I said, it's an art school that's happened from time to time. And I said, uh, what, what happened? He said, that film, that film. And I said, it's really beautiful, so painterly. He said, Roth. The father beat the crap out of the children all the time. And it's shown in a very direct way, very painful way. And, and I said, yeah, he said, my father abused me. My father beat the hell out of me all the time. He was trembling. And I felt terrible. Not because it's a bad film, because I hadn't actually thought about him. Or people like him in the classroom. It's a big enough class that you have some people who have this experience. So I said, I'm really sorry. I said, would you have preferred not to see the film? He looked at me like I was a creep. He said, you idiot. Of course I wanted to see the film. It's so beautiful. Still, he's a struggle. And I said, I said, what would you want me to do? And he said, I don't know. You're the teacher. <laughs> he stormed off. And, and now when I teach, of course, I say this to the kids, kind of jesting. But I also want to say, in a room that big, with that many people, some people are going to have a very different relation to what I think I'm teaching than others. And as a teacher, I want to not lose them. <laughs> I, I teach this virtue and vice class. We do a rape memoir. We, I did a, used to do a philosophical text on rape discourse and who's allowed to use it. And it was a great feminist text, but it was so abstract. So now we read a memoir by a woman who was raped at a university. I have a lot of students in that class. It's likely that some of them have had experience with sexual assault. So I say, I, but it's, I, I'm not going to not talk about sexual assault because it's too that, that dangerous. It's so important to what we're talking about in this class. But I do say, I realize some of you are not going to be have the same relation to this material. Some of you will have experienced sexual assault. And if you can't do this week work, let, we'll, talk, let's find some, we'll find something else. I've had a few, hundreds of students now since I started doing that. I've had one person say, you know, I'm not sure I can do that. And then a few weeks later, I asked them, so how do you want to approach that week? And she said, I'll be fine. And I don't know how exactly I understand this, but I think part of it is that people feel like we're doing this as a class. We're doing this together. They're not all buddies or anything, but there's a certain sense that, yeah, this material is very damaging and very dangerous, but we need to confront it and work through it um, so that attuning them to the challenges is, I think, an exercise of, uh, of making speech more productive. <laughs> um, warning not so that you don't hear things, but warning so that people can hear things in a more educative uh, way. Yes? Um, so earlier you said how active citizenship is only a small part of voting. What ways do you reckon is the best way for active citizenship? Yeah, I wish I knew. You know, I'm a university guy. I spent my, almost my, since I'm 18, I've been on a college campus. I was at a think tank for a few years. So I'm not sure I know the, the I actually, I'm sure I don't know the best way, but I do think, depending on what kind of citizen you are or want to be or what kind of community you live in and what the issues are where you live, um, finding a, a public practice, if I could put it that way, that feels meaningful to you, it seems like an important ingredient of a good life, let me put it that way, and an important thing in a country that aspires to democratic legitimacy, uh, or, and, and in communities that do. I, I, uh, uh, I live on campus at West Man, but when I'm not on campus, we have a house in a small, uh, very small community in, in western Massachusetts. Um, and the whole town has to approve the budget. I mean, everybody goes for that meeting. And it's a kind of uh, inefficient exercise of democracy, but there's also a, there's, a com there's a communal dimension to it where people take responsibility for their neighbors, for their roads, for their 
you know, for things that have to do with our public life. And so I think that depending on who you are and your appetite for conversation and debate and, um, and issues, uh, finding uh, a public practice uh, uh, that feels meaningful to you is, for me, that would be the best kind of citizenship. I, I, I do think voting is important. I hope people do that. Um, and one of the things I hope our students do is register lots of people to vote. But I think that the, before you get to vote, whether, well, it doesn't have to be like a caucus in, in Iowa, but conversation um, and um, participation in public life seems to me to lead individuals to find the best food for themselves. Yes? So uh, we got, you said this about uh, your institution, I would say about our institution here, probably all across the country when it comes to universities, uh, that they're very overwhelmingly liberal and progressive. Uh, so I was wondering, when it comes to free speech and about bringing more conservatives on campus, do you think that it's, I mean, why in the sense that all universities seem to be that way? Or why, like, is that a symptom, or are we trying to fix that for the university, or why might that be the university? Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. It gets back to the question that was asked before about whether some fields have affinities with some ideologies. Um, certainly, you have to stay. I, I had this debate with a trust, former trustee, Matt Wesleyan, who was a member of the board of the Cato Institute. He's a real libertarian. And I was trying to get him to join the board at Wesleyan, partly because I, he had such a different point of view on almost everything than the rest of the board members. Uh, Megan will remember. And, and uh, he hesitated, and he asked me the same question. So why is it that all of these professors seem to have come from a, 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 a smallish family of, of, of political ideologists? And I joked in response that they spent 12 years in graduate school, and the starting salary is $72,000. <laughs> do you know any Republicans who would do that? And he said he didn't. And we laughed about it. I don't know if that's a good enough, it's not a good enough explanation. But I do think that um, 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 there is, it's hard to know how much of this is, a, is a, a product of bias and how much of it is a product of the fact that education breeds a kind of a questioning and self-criticism uh, that, that doesn't have easy affinities with conservatism and religion, which are very much geared towards the preservation uh, of things from the past, and insofar as they're geared to change, they're geared to organic, usually in the great conservative tradition, organic change. So it's not really a bad thing then, in that sense? So for intellectual diversity, it's not a bad thing that it's somewhat homogenous? Or is it, it's still I think it's, a, I think it's, it's let me use the word, suboptimal. I don't think it's a good thing. I, I, I think that, that um, uh, I mean, people used to ask me at an art school, there aren't that many conservative artists. And an art school. And that's not because of the ideology, it's just because the the kind of crazy, adventurous, change, you know, throw everything out artists that were at California College of the Arts, I mean, if they were conservative, they would, in such an idiosyncratic way that no other conservatives would have recognized, you know. But so I just think there was a kind of a cultivation of originality and idiosyncrasy that's different from. Um, uh, rooted in family, community, and organic change that uh, uh, is connected to traditions of conservatism. Uh, that said, I do think it's, I, I, uh, I have a professor uh, who's there for a couple of years now, uh, and he came to see me and said, you know, I teach, he teaches religion in American history. Really important subject in our history department. He says, you know, I'm the only churchgoer in the social science building. <laughs> And I'm sitting there, because he knows I had made this case for intellectual diversity, and he would like me to extend his contract. And, 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 and he's very good. And, and, and so then I'm thinking, going through my mind, you know, all the people I knew, I said to him, How do you don't know that's true? But I wasn't, maybe, I wasn't sure. Um, and, and I do think that um, there are a lot of people who participate in organizations, especially religious ones, that are not usually seen in regard to progressive uh, causes, uh, 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 and, but they're not, they, they're not out on campus, I can use that expression. So I have many faculty colleagues who actually do go to church, or I go to Torah study at my synagogue, uh, 
But we don't actually talk about that so much. I do. Uh, uh, but most people don't talk about that. Or they say, they don't want to mix that. Maybe it has to back to that first question of the difference between a, 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 a religious kind of public life and a political kind of public life. I think that um, the more open we are to the possibilities that we could be wrong, the more we can learn. And when we are open to the possibilities that we can be wrong, uh, we, we seek out people with different views of our own. And I think that if we can't find people with different views of our own, because everybody's, that's a problem. And, and so that's why I make the argument for intellectual diversity that I do. Yes, maybe a couple more questions. I'll come back here. Yeah, so you were saying that you wouldn't have like Nazis come in for intellectual diversity, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, right. That's commonly agreed. So I also assume you probably wouldn't have like people from the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan. But like, where do you draw the line of like Richard Spencer and like white supremacy? Like, would you want him there? No. Okay, all right. <laughs> but also, like, when you say no like that, yeah, yeah. It, it does create a problem where they do pull the free speech card, or they, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. individuals do pull the free speech card, and then that's a problem. Or, like, we had about Michigan State, and then there was, like, you know, physical altercations that were happening. Like, yeah. It feels like a little bit of a lose-lose, and I just wanted to hear It is. Words. I think it is a lose-lose. Uh, when you get to a point where people want to come here just to test your free speech, right. I mean, it would be also if they, it, I mean, uh, if someone came here and said, I actually want to recruit for child pornography, but it will be outside the country, so it's not illegal. I, I, this is, I'm making this up, but sure. you'd probably not feel you had to. The state legislature probably wouldn't make you <coughs> do that. Uh, um, and and um, so, I, but I've been in private institutions, and so we have more leeway. And my hero as a young professor was the president of Pomona College, who I was told, I'm not sure it was true, but I was told that the, uh, a Nazi group from Orange County was, had rented space at Pomona College. We're meeting there. They had an innocuous name, uh, 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 Revisionist History Association or something. And they were a bunch of neo-Nazis. And, and so when uh, uh, the president found out, um, uh, he, he went out and said, get off the campus. And the university council, as they will do, they'll say, oh, you can't do this. She'll sue us. And he said, yeah, they'll sue us. Uh, we're, we can, we've been sued before, I've learned to say. <laughs> um, and I think that's the right thing to do because it is undermines the mission of the uh, school um, and it um, uh, creates an environment of hostility, intimidation, and harassment for certain groups of students. Um, that said, I almost always, almost always, would defer to the possibility that this guy may be right, even though I disagree vehemently with him. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, a much less extreme example, um, but at Wesleyan, it was a, it was a surprise. Um, I got a recommendation from the faculty. Uh, we have a free speech uh, series. We have every year somebody comes, and uh, they recommended that I invite <laughs> Justice Scalia. Uh, so it was seven years ago, or something like that. And uh, I thought now this faculty group is further to the left than I, um, and so I thought that it was it was baiting me because they thought I wouldn't do it or that. And so I thought, I'll invite Justice Scalia because he won't come because he's very busy. Um, and um, I get a letter almost immediately back from Justice Scalia saying, uh, uh, Larry Lessig was just there two years ago. I heard from him. He had a great visit to Wesleyan. I'd love to come. Now, Larry Lessig, as you may know, is pretty far on the left, um, but he clerked for school. So I was in a little bit of a pickle because I feel and felt at the time that Justice Scalia did more harm to the interpretation of the American Constitution than almost anyone in the last hundred years. And yet I was his host. And I thought, well, you know, I also could be wrong. I feel that way, but I may be wrong. Um, if I wasn't his host, I would have stood outside the building, as some of my colleagues did, <laughs> especially in sociology, um, banging on pans and, and protesting his being there because you could pick a lot of issues, from guns to homophobia. Um, uh, but I didn't. I introduced him. I put one little footnote to Leonard Levy, who was a historian of the American Constitution that Justice Scalia detested, um, and he winked at me, and he, uh, he's very smart, to put it mildly. He gave a talk. He spent a day on campus arguing with students. There were protests. Some people stood up in the room with orange jumpsuits. We've got Guantanamo. 
Um, somebody came around and said, you have to sit down and leave. They either sat down or left. He gave his talk. I'm not saying everybody was kumbaya afterwards. There were people very angry. At some point, somebody else, why don't you call on a woman for a change? Because he had called only on men. And he, you know, he acquiesced. <laughs> but it was, a, I thought, a great uh, encounter. There were protests. There was debate. There was intellectual exchange. And, and he was happy to take any kind of question. Now, um, that seemed to me really educative. Um, and, and, um, uh, but bringing someone just because they ha hold a very extreme point of view, especially an extreme point of view that calls for um, the, uh, the de, well, the, the uh, involves the dehumanization of important segments of the campus, that, that seems to be a mistake. I say that most of the time, I and most presidents, we don't invite people. We're put in a position to either veto a student or faculty choice or not. And um, I've tried to invite people who I don't agree with, um, but not people who are there just to provoke outrage. Yes. Um, I'd like to. Uh, I'll use this. No, I'll just speak up. Uh, I'd like to uh, sort of push you, you know, back in the direction of the end of my introduction, <laughs> um, in the sense that uh, in the end where I'm sort of saying because of all this outrage journalism on both sides, it's very hard for us to actually know what really is happening uh, on university campuses. So um, uh, I'm going to conclude by asking you to say a little bit more about that, because it seems to me, well, let me begin this way. I very much admire the account that you gave. In each issue that you took up, you have a real appreciation for the argument on both sides. This is what you've expressed. This is the true purpose of education. And it seems to me that you, know, you, uh, you model that very well. And, uh, and it's really important, and, and uh, I really appreciate your participation here. Um, and so that leads you uh, to a view that with respect to these various issues of uh, 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 diversity and safe spaces and free speech and so on, um, basically your position is you know, not too much and not too little, very Aristotelian. But, uh, and I, I can't bring myself to disagree with any of that, but the question then is getting back to away from the ought to the is, so America today, the university today in America, are they too much or too little with respect to these three things? Now, you've actually already answered that question with respect to diversity. You've taken a very clear and strong stand that right now, where we are, there's not enough uh, you know, participation uh, on the part of the more conservative or religious or libertarian uh, thinkers. So you've sort of answered that. But with respect to the other two, you, you haven't so much address that question. So with respect to political correctness and with respect to free speech, do you think, where do you think we are with respect to the golden mean that you're aiming for? Is it too much free speech, not enough free speech, and similarly with political correctness? Thank you, thank you. Uh, so I, I think that, um, I think political correctness is, um, if, if it's, if we mean by that just a, Conform, conformism, then there's always too much. You, you, you can never push back enough against conformism. But, but I think that the label is, is, um, is, is the phrase, because it has just been weaponized as a way of avoiding other issues. And, 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 and also, it leads to a kind of, well, I have to be more sensitive about X, but I'm not going to be more sensitive about Y, because that's politically correct. So um, I, was, uh, I, I was doing a bookstore event in Madison, Connecticut, a very privileged town on the coast of uh, Connecticut, not far from where Wesley is. And um, right before I went down, an older gentleman who had a book club there, they were reading Homer. Um, he came to say hello, said he knew my work, he wanted to talk, he was a retired professor. And he said, oh yes, I see you're talking about uh, political correctness. Um, and he said, kind of winked at me, and, uh, more or less, and said, oh, are you going to tell them what your pronouns are? So for him, it was okay to make a joke about pronouns and um, gender fluidity, let me call it that. Um, you know, and I was very conscious of the fact that if it was 20 years ago, 
he could have said something about, I can't believe they let a Jew in here. And, or 25 years ago in Madison, Connecticut. Um, and um, 15 years ago, and there was a, uh, well, there was one person of color came who was a colleague of mine, it was. But he wouldn't make a joke about black people now. But in a similar situation 40 years ago, very easily. And so I think that this idea that somehow when people ask us to be accommodating for the feelings and attitudes of other people, that that's, a, that that's a big problem. I don't see this as a big problem. I think we have a long way to go before we treat uh, students from marginalized <coughs> groups as, uh, as equal citizens of a university community. In terms of uh, do we have enough uh, uh, free speech? We don't have enough intellectual diversity, I've answered that, but do we have enough free speech? I, I mean, do we, I think the question is really, do we have enough speech? Uh, you know, I, I, I think um, it's important that, um, that students and faculty um, feel empowered to speak up when they find that um, they're being silenced by an institution or by a faculty member. And I've said that, you know, when, when people complain about being silenced, uh, it's because they have a lack of courage. Now, I have been criticized for that. They say, well, that's easy for you to say, Roth. You're a privileged white guy. What about students from marginalized groups who it's not just courage, it's that they know uh, oppression as part of their history. And I think, I take that. I think that's a, they, I still think it's incumbent upon all of us to help people find the courage to participate in these conversations. And I don't think you could say there's, you know, too much conversation. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, in that sense, I think it's really, I'm very much influenced by Dick Rorty, who's a teacher of mine. I, I, I think that getting participation uh, in conversation, being conscious of the ways in which inequality distorts conversations, um, is, is our goal. So is there too much speech? No, I don't think there's too much speech. Uh, uh, do we worry too much about free speech? I think we have, we have frames, many people have accepted the framing of free speech um, that's been in a, of a libertarian variety, and I think that's intellectually uh, damaging. I think it's, it's wrong-headed. Um, and and I, I think that uh, you can have a commitment to free expression and free speech and still take into account uh, power um, and 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 uh, damage, as Jim, Jeremy Walton said, you could still do that and not sacrifice um, uh, the kinds of uh, speech we need to have at a university. So you hear me sliding back to the middle there. That that I think we need surely more speech, but I don't think we should train our students um, to tolerate offensiveness in the name of uh, of free speech. Um, I think we have to help them figure out the difference between harassment um, and uh, bold inquiry. Um, so I got in trouble uh, at Wesleyan because of the op-ed version from the uh, Statement of Spaces of the Times. I said that when I was a student, it was pretty routine, I use the word routine, for students to have, for professors to have sex with their students. And a guy at Wesleyan who was a retired faculty member he wrote me this very angry letter. He said, "Routine, routine. I was here then." And I couldn't tell if he said, "Like I, I missed out on everything." <laughs> uh, um, and he said, yeah, "That's just a lie." He says, "A lie." And I thought about it because I, I hadn't paused on the word routine, but, but then I realized I had friends, women friends at Wesleyan, in that time who just talked about having sex with professors as if it was, at best, a routine. <laughs> um, and 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 I think that that was a act. Not always, but often it was a form of intimidation and harassment. And I've heard from many women students from that period uh, about the, the use of intimidation and harassment to control their lives. I've heard from gay students and queer students who, who used to walk by fraternities at their peril because part of the hazing ritual at Wesleyan, people were told us at a board meeting once, was to go find a, a, a gay person and beat them up. And, and that's not that long. I mean, I am old, but it's still within uh, this living memory. So I think we, we haven't gone far enough in providing an equitable climate in which people are empowered to speak because they know they can, the space is safe enough for them to do so without fear of retaliation.
That sounded like a kind of conclusion, and yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's, a, it's about 7 o'clock, so should I just thank everyone for coming? And it's so uh, nice of you to thank you. Okay, thank you.